Welcome back to the Big Kahuna Podcast. I'm Lauren Schantz, and this is episode two. Today, we're going to start our deep dive into strategic planning. Over the next few episodes, we're going to look at different ways that, or different aspects of what needs to be considered when planning to uh, market your business and increase your revenue, your visibility, and uh, the sales of your uh, goods and services. I like to start by taking a look at an old video clip. This is a, a 1977 TV miniseries called Ike, The Warriors. And we're going to take a peek at a strategic planning session and then see what we can glean out of that. I'm going to stop and start it a little bit and make some comments along the way. And then we'll get into our conversation uh, from there. All right completely unsuitable for glider landings and targets for your paratroopers impossible to hit in darkness. Your 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions will suffer 70% losses in glider strength and at least 50% losses in paratroop strength before they even hit the ground. Let me just stop for a minute. This little session here is the end of a longer session of batting ideas back and forth weighing their uh, strengths and weaknesses, uh, arguing different perspectives, all of which is an important function in uh, strategic planning. You ought to come to the table with a number of uh, divergent views of informed individuals, and those ideas should be thrown on the table and freely discussed, even argued over. But at some point, a decision has to be made. So let's look at how the Prime Minister, uh, Winston Churchill, starts to bring the conversation to a conclusion. Men, gentlemen, you'll find I believe in total democracy in these decisions. I'm perfectly willing to hear everyone out before having my own way. Then what is your own way? We already have forces on the continent in Italy. I suggest they strike northward into Germany. So this first part here, uh, Churchill's laying out his proposition by uh, citing the evidence uh, or the supporting facts. In this case, uh, he's recommending uh, using existing uh, soldiers on the continent from Italy and heading up into Germany versus the bigger idea, the D-Day uh, plan of bringing uh, millions of soldiers across the English Channel and possibly running the risk of losing millions of people. Prime Minister, the Russian army is a lot closer to Berlin than we are. That's my dear gentlemen. Interesting situation here. Uh, Churchill's motivation was to get to Berlin sooner than the Russians. He had a political motivation. On the other hand, uh, Eisenhower's goal was totally different. His goal was to win the war. He was It was irrelevant whether the Russians got there first or the, uh, the, allied, the other allied forces. His goal was to beat uh, Nazi Germany, get to Berlin, and end the war. Similar goals, but different goals. Setting the right goal is crucial to having the proper plan for your organization. And do your orders suggest handing half of your over to the Russians? My orders are simple. Enter the continent across the channel. Aim at the heart of Germany, not her rear end. It's the only way to put the German army in a nutcracker. Interesting point Churchill raises here in World War I, the generals advised that it had to be this way. This is the only way. That's seldom true. Uh, when we find ourselves saying this is the only way we could do it, we may be uh, putting ourselves in a position where we have no choice but to lose. It's very important to, uh, as objectively as possible, and that's tough because all of us have our subjective opinions, but as objectively as possible, weigh the different uh, propositions and see if there is a better way. 
World War II with World War I thinking. If the Russian army gains control of Western Europe, we'd all better start thinking of World War III. We've got to fight this war first. The impregnable West Wall. To hell with the West Wall. There are no longer any fixed defenses. There are no. Very important. When you're making your plans, you have to consider your resources. You have to consider your obstacles. And is the cost of achieving your goal beyond what you're able to afford? If it is, you need to find a different way or not proceed at all. Uh, but if it's within grasp, if it's uh, something that you're able to uh, accommodate, then you need to make a, a decision from conviction and move forward. Mr. Prime Minister, you promised our president that England would join in the assault across the channel. I may have then. And I may have changed my mind now. A politician's prerogative. Well, sir, I'm a soldier, not a politician. My mind has not changed from the very beginning. My title is Supreme Commander. Now, does that mean anything? Is this my military command or is it yours alone? I'd just like to point out an interesting fact. Um, the people tasked with the job may not be the owner of the company. And so if the owner does turn over uh, the management of the uh, development of the plan and, and the execution of the plan to managers, then uh, the managers need to know that the owner is going to support their decision, their way of going forward. You British have my resignation here and now. Are you asking the First Minister of the British Empire for unconditional surrender? I'm asking for him to live up to his word. Sometimes, my dear, I... That is even more difficult. But I take no satisfaction in gaining my way if I know my way is in fear. Don't start being reasonable. You only make it tougher. On the other hand, the business owner ought to be challenging the managers to come up with the best plan. He needs to challenge their assumptions, needs to challenge their projections, needs to challenge their actions or planned actions. And then when he's uh, satisfied that they are committed to a good course of action, then he needs to acquiesce and turn his support over to those leaders. All right. This is how I see it. General Montgomery is absolutely right. We don't have enough landing craft to conduct two invasions at once. We'll take those intended for southern France. Okay. Resource management. Uh, assess what you have available, and then the best use of those resources. Resources are finite. Uh, sure, success will bring more resources, but when you launch your program, you have a finite amount to work with. Make sure it's uh, allocated to the right things, the most important things. What I liked about Eisenhower in this uh, element is that he did uh, not only stand up for his own perspective, his own goals, but he also listened to the other people, the other gentlemen in the room, and uh, took in account their good advice. I, you've become a very dangerous man. The time to get off our tails has arrived. You have learned my secret of making any compromise that will let you get your own way. You're learning to be a politician. Someday, I do not doubt, you will run for president. God forbid. Prime Minister, I still feel we're Monty, not Monty, for God's sake, it's settled, done. I am in this thing with you to the end. And if it fails, we will go down together. Two things here that are uh, critical. Uh, one, once the decision is made, the, uh, the discussion stops. Uh, Field Marshal Montgomery still wasn't personally convinced, even though his boss and General Eisenhower had uh, come to an agreement. Uh, he was asked to shut up, and uh, that's good advice. Once the decision's made, don't keep at it. That's just politicking. It's time to get behind it. Give it your full commitment and move forward. Uh, there is a sense of urgency. Yes, we have to not rush into something blindly, but once this decision's made, and the resources are available, it's time to get going. Let's not let moss grow under our feet. 
All right. Let's uh, turn our attention now to some other uh, considerations when it comes to strategic planning. For the balance of this conversation, I would like to, I would like to look at 11 elements to a, an effective a marketing plan. And in the next episodes, we'll start to dive into each one of them in more depth. So the first thing that I think is important to consider is our purpose. What is it that motivates us? What is it that gives us uh, that sense of purpose? Why is it that we get up every morning and pursue that particular goal? Well, uh, in the case of the video we were watching, uh, the purpose was to uh, win the war. Uh, the, the alternative was not acceptable to be put under the dictatorship of the Nazi party. Uh, was not uh, an outcome that was favored by really anyone. And so the purpose, the thing that drove the, uh, the generals forward uh, and caused them to risk everything was to the freedom that they were pursuing through the defeat of the uh, Axis uh, powers. So in your situation, what is it that motivates you? Why are you in business? What is the purpose that you are pursuing? Well, on one hand, we would talk about money. Of course, uh, shareholders are looking for a good return. Uh, employees are looking for a good paycheck. Uh, business owners are wanting to make lots of money to pursue their uh, dreams and, and uh, pleasures. But beyond that, what is it about this business? Is there something philosophical, something spiritual, something um, ideological that is driving you forward that makes this the thing you want to pursue over anything else you could be doing with your life. We call this the purpose statement or the why statement and uh, we'll delve into how to develop that in the future but the first area that we want to understand before we build any other plan is why are we doing it? What are we wanting to accomplish? The second thing we'll want to look at is our vision. How do we see the future after we do what we're about to do? So we know why we're doing it, but what is it that we're actually driving towards? What is it that we see can be different? Uh, business people, uh, are often innovators. They're uh, creative. They're um, not content with the status quo. And when they see a problem and come up with an idea that they think can be done uh, to solve that problem better than whatever the other answers currently are, it gives them a reason to start a business. And they have a vision. Often they have a vision. Or if they don't have a, a concrete vision, they need to work towards uh, having something they can write down and share with others. And that is a future state. So we see what the situation is today. We understand what the problem that's in front of us is. And we've, we have this drive now to solve that problem for as many people as we can. And we then look to the future and we say, if we do this, if our customer buys this from us, if this is uh, accepted in the marketplace, this is what the future is going to look like. This is how it's going to be different. This is how lives will be improved. This is where the company will be three years, five years, 10 years out. This is where... I, as the business owner or the manager, am going to be. This is how my life is going to be different. This is how the lives of my customers will be different. We want to articulate vision. Why is that? Why are we even going through these exercises? Purpose, vision. 
It's because it gives the clarity to what we are doing. Because when we enlist the help of others, managers, employees, uh, partners, investors, they need to understand this. They're, it's your v purpose, your vision, but they need to share it. And the better we communicate it, the more effective we are going to be in bringing together these important partners that will be a big part of our success. So we want to understand our purpose. We need to uh, articulate our vision. And then we need to think about the culture of our organization. Cultures essentially defined by the values that we hold the values that we share. And why is that important? Because uh, no man is an island. Isn't that true? Uh, we need to attract to us people of like mind, of uh, like conscience, that are going to work together towards uh, achieving the vision and the purpose that you've set as the business owner. Culture is what attracts to us the people that we want to work with, people that share the things that we feel are important, that can get behind and be excited and enthusiastically support the type of organization that we want to build. But it's not just our uh, team and our people, it's also our customers. Customers are drawn uh, to organizations that share the values that they hold. So the closer aligned our values are to our customers' values, the more likely those customers that we uh, seek uh, to uh, engage and uh, bring into our family, uh, the more likely that that's going to happen. It's also going to have the wonderful side benefit of repelling people, either empl potential employees or uh, investors or customers that are not a good fit for our organization. It's important not only to know who we want to work with, but we also need to know who we don't want to work with. And essentially, these are folks that just do not share our values, that can't get behind what we're after and or what we're seeking after. And uh, that's a good thing. We don't need to sell to everybody. We don't need to hire anybody. At some points, we feel like that's true. Uh, I'll just hire anybody so I have some help. Well, no, define the culture, define the purpose, define the vision and hire the right person. Might take a little longer, might be a little bit more expensive, but in the long run, you're going to be uh, just head and shoulder above where you would have been otherwise. As well, there's times that we just are willing to take on any customer. We need the cash flow. We need to build the business. We need some action happening. But the wrong customer is devastating. They're not happy, so they leave bad reviews. Um, we're not able to do the best job possible, so we feel bad about what we've done. Often, uh, they'll occupy way more time than we can afford to a lot. And in the end, it just isn't as satisfactory on many accounts as it would be if we uh, clarified our message and uh, attracted the right customer. So, purpose, vision, culture. These things need to be defined. Once that's understood, we need to start uh, creating some likability about the organization. Uh, there's a, an old adage that uh, I've essentially lived by uh, since I've been in the marketing industry. And that's the, the saying that goes, uh, folks, buy from people that they know, so visible, like, this is our likability or what we're about to talk about in a minute, our pers personality, and trust. And we're going to talk about authority as well. So people buy from people they know, they like, and they trust. 
your brand personality focuses on likability. That's right. So you know how in everyday life, there's some people you click with, some people you don't. There's people you like spending time with, and there's people that, well, quite frankly, you have no interest in spending any time with. Or worse, you just can't stand it when you are in their presence. And why is that? More often than not, it has to do with personality. Personalities that attract, and unfortunately, in some cases, personalities that clash. Well, as a business organization, it's important that we understand our client and our client's perception of who we are and have a personality that um, uh, legitimately or authentically reflects who we are as an organization, but also is uh, presented in terms of visible uh, identity, uh, your colors, logos, fonts, uh, imagery, etc., as well as in your messaging, your tone, the voice, uh, the types of uh, informations that are communicated. And all of that comes under the guise of personality. What is the personality of your brand? Is the customer that you're seeking to do business with drawn to the brand's personality? Or are they repelled? You may have the best product in the world. You may have the best reason for doing what you're doing. And you may have a fantastic, a fantastic vision set out in front of you. But if your customer doesn't like you, they're not going to buy from you. You're not going to realize your goals. So time and effort has to be put into personality. We'll talk about how to understand personality and how to develop that in all of your marketing and your sales activities. All right. We have a winning personality. So let's develop a brand guide. What is a brand guide? A brand guide is essentially a book or a booklet that defines how we present our brand to the world. It uh, consists of a number of important elements and uh, the document itself is designed uh, so that our salespeople and our marketing people are following a set of predefined rules so there's continuity and consistency with the messaging that goes out that reinforces uh, our personality, reinforces what we want communicated so that we can achieve our goals in terms of uh, marketing goals for certain things like generating visibility, genu uh, um, developing uh, not only awareness, but engagement with the brand, having uh, clients start to consider whether we're the right fit for their need to be filled. And um, the brand guide is essential uh, to ensuring that that happens uh, all the time. Uh, not only do we need a brand guide, but we need to work out our brand story. Marketing has really embraced the idea of storytelling. And storytelling is nothing new. Storytelling is how forever we sold things. We would share how uh, we were uh, embracing a, a problem that needed to be solved. We would um, uh, identify how, uh, as a consumer, that problem couldn't be solved themselves, how it was beyond them, and how they needed someone to come alongside and present um, uh uh, an approach or a product to have empathy to the problem and authority to solve it, to have an action plan, uh, to have a call to action so that um, people actually not only enjoy hearing what you have to offer, but they actually embrace and 
and take a step. And we need to identify the benefits that are gained in working with you and the problems that are resolved. And often there's a change in client state. They're, they're uncertain, they're unsatisfied, they're scared about the future before working with you, but afterwards they're confident, they, they believe that they are in a better position, that type of thing. There's character development. Well, that's all brand story. And the better we are in developing our story and utilizing it in all of our marketing elements, the more we're going to be able to effectively and emotionally draw people to you. Buying decisions uh, are not rational necessarily. There's a, uh, and this goes back to the purpose, and we'll talk about this more in the purpose statement and developing that. But essentially, people buy emotionally, and then they rationalize the decision analytically. So the brand story is the way we engage our audience, our client, project, uh, prospective client emotionally. So they make the decision to buy. And then everything else we provide is there to reinforce that decision and make them feel good about the decision they made. So brand story is an important element. That's the sixth element. The seventh element is identifying our ideal client profile. This is defining who your audience is and what will motivate them to take action. Now, I have worked with a lot of customers over the years and I'll ask them, tell me, who is your client? Who is, what's your market? Who are you selling to? And they'll say, well, anybody could buy our product. And for a lot of products and services, that's absolutely true. If I am if I provide duct cleaning services, anybody with a duct is a possible client. But is that really true? If I'm based in uh, Toronto and uh, I have a, radi uh, a practical range of 50 miles, am I going to try and attract a customer in Montreal? No. So geography may be a factor in who our ideal client is. If I have a product that is um, uh, priced at a much higher rate than uh, uh, an alternative product, is someone with less income likely to buy my product? No, I've, I have a product that's going to fit a higher income level. So income is uh, one of the demographic considerations. What about, um, is it a product service that's ideal for uh, uh, someone in a managerial role or is it someone that's working on the line? Is it a, a product that's uh, uh, for a, a woman or is it for a man? Is it a uh, product or service that uh, fits a certain age group? All these considerations help us define who our ideal client is. Now, with an ideal client profile, you are trying to make it as tight and as nuanced as possible. And so we may come up with something uh, like a um, 40 to 50 year old woman living in Toronto with an income over $100,000 a year, holding a managerial position who uh, commutes uh, in uh, using public transit, but enjoys uh, a luxury uh, vehicle uh, for traveling to visit friends and family on the weekends. Uh, we may also integrate some psychographics. Uh, they're highly motivated because of whatever the factor may be. That is, an, that is an example of an ideal client profile. Now, as, as the selling organization, uh, you may say, well, that's one of my clients. But uh, there's other clients that I can service as well. So define a second client profile or a third. The goal, though, is to focus the majority of your messaging on those ideal clients. Yes, you may be able to sell some other clients as well, but you only have so many words. You have only so many uh, ads that you can run. You, 
you're, you're constrained by practical uh, considerations. So use your marketing uh, assets wisely. And one of the wisest decisions is to zero in on your very best customer, ideal client profiles. All right, now that we know uh, who our client is, we need to identify where they currently are in the buying journey. What's the buying journey? Well, the buying journey is very important. Uh, the, you may have the perfect product for the perfectly defined individual, and you should have no problem selling to them, but there is one problem. And that problem is they've never heard of you. They don't know you exist. To them, you're not even a consideration. So what? where are they in terms of the buying journey? They're needing to uh, become aware of you. Maybe they're just becoming aware of their problem. Maybe they're becoming aware of their need. So awareness is... The, really the starting place in the buying journey. The client needs to be aware of what their need is and they need to be aware of you and your brand and the possibility that you can uh, uh, help them with their uh, problem. Once they're aware of you, they move into an engagement or consideration stage. In this stage, now that they're aware of you, they start looking at what you have to offer, what you have to say. They start comparing you with competitive products or services. Uh, they start looking at uh, whether what you have to offer would be a good fit for their need. They look at your brand. Are you someone that they like? Are, they, are you someone that they would put their money behind? Do they support you? Do they support your cause and mission? So all those things that we talked about at the beginning of this uh, episode, start to play an important part in the consideration stage. Well, let's say that they've they've narrowed it down. They've, they've decided they do want to buy something and they want to buy it from you or one or two competitors. So they've narrowed down uh, the potential supplier of their need, uh, the product to solve their need. So this is now the buying stage. This is where they look at prices. They look at options. They look at, uh, they weigh the strength of the company versus the competitor. Uh, they look at uh, your reputation. They look at your uh, offers. What is the price point? Uh, what is the feature set? All these are part of the buying decision. And then they become your customer. They, uh, they purchase the product, and then your job is to delight them in that buying decision. So you help them with uh, training. You help them with educational materials. You help them with how-to ideas. Um, but this is uh, the part where you're now trying to take them from a customer who's just bought and turn them into a loyal customer someone who becomes an evangelist for your brand, someone who's going to recommend you to their friends and family, someone that's going to write a review and recommend you. It's important that to understand that the buying journey does not end with the sale unless you want to come up short on where you could be. The loyalty cycle is where you build deep relationships with your customers. And then one of two things is going to happen. The first is they may choose to buy again. Maybe it's the same product, maybe it's another product, but you're going to be top of the list because of the relationship that's been established and the experience they had the first time they bought from you. The other thing that could be happening is someone they know is ready to buy. And so their recommendation heavily influences their uh, contact in making that decision. And those, in this case, you may actually see that the buying cycle or the buying journey is shortened because the, uh, the awareness has been dealt with. Their friend recommended them. 
the consideration stage has been shortened because their friend has said, hey, this is a good product. I endorse it. And they put a lot of weight in their friends. And so now you're into the buying stage and you're there potentially a lot faster than you might otherwise have been. And consequently, you're there a lot less expensively. It's cheaper to land that referral customer than it is to go and do all that advertising promotion and to make people aware of you. And then the time it takes to convince them that you're the right uh, provider and then getting into buying mode. So the buyer's journey is building awareness uh, for your brand, uh, helping the, the buyer consider and consider you and your offerings. Then there's the buying stage where they actually come to the point where they exchange money for the product or service. And then there's the loyalty component where you build relationship and develop more sales as a result of having delighted customers. So our marketing efforts and our planning and all that needs to consider your ideal client at each stage of the buyer's journey and what types of uh, channels, messaging channels, what type of message, what type of assets and things that need to be made available at each stage of the journey. That's a pretty big deal. And that brings us now to specific goals and tactics. Your purpose statement, your vision sets before you where you want to get. But it's very important, just like in the uh, video clip that we looked at at the beginning of this podcast, is to consider the tactical elements of how we're going to get there. And taking the big goal or the big vision and breaking it down into manageable goals and what we typically have recommended, I typically recommend over uh, for our clients is looking at what do you want to achieve uh, in the first year? Where do you want to be by the third year? Where do you want to be in 10 years? So that's your forward looking goal setting. Now, a one year goal is a lot easier to action, obviously, than a 10 year goal. But a one-year goal is still a pretty big chunk to, uh, to bite off uh, in one goal. So what we recommend then, and it's been very effective for a lot of our clients, is take that one-year goal and break it into quarterly goals. So for example, the one-year goal might be uh, generating $1 million in new sales. Well, that's great. But how much do we need to generate in Q1? How much in Q2? How much in Q3? How much in Q4? You may have a plan of um, totally replacing and or updating your uh, uh, management system. That's a big goal, especially in a big company. So are there quarterly steps? We'll start by uh, in Q1 assessing all of our needs, our assets that are available, uh, what information we need. In quarter two, start uh, designing the, uh, the system and how it's going to fit our specific needs. Uh, Q3 might be taking all the existing assets and anything new and getting them into the new system and configuring it the way it needs to be. Q4 is then rolling it out and working out the bugs. So uh, we had an example of a financial goal or a revenue goal, uh, annual, that could be then broken into quarters. It could be a, an operational goal, like implementing a new management system. It could be um, uh, marketing goals that are, yes, sales goals related to revenue, but a marketing goal might have to do with uh, launching a strong social media campaign. We're going to do that in Q1. And then add... Um, telemarketing in Q2 and Q3, uh, search engine optimization, Q4, uh, a strong CRM so that we can nurture our uh, prospects. So there's different goals that we want to set that are going to drive us towards our uh, big goals or our vision. 
Then we're going to break them into smaller goals, uh, revenue, operational, marketing, financial, etc. And then uh, we're going to take those quarterly goals and see about chunking them down a little bit more. Uh, there's three uh, months in a quarter. Let's set some monthly goals. Let's take that quarterly goal and break it into, uh, into monthly goals. And then there's four weeks in a month. So now do we set weekly goals? By setting weekly goals, th these are smaller pieces that we can build successful completion on, which drives us towards achieving the bigger goal. In a month, we'll have uh, accomplished four, uh, four smaller things. And then in three months, we'll have uh, accomplished our quarterly goal and so on and so forth. So when we look at uh, goal setting, we look at uh, forward, uh, one year, three year, 10 year. Then we take that one year goal, break it into quarterly uh, segments. Then the quarter is broken into monthly and the monthly is broken into weekly. And then tasks are assigned for each stage of the path forward. This is now bringing us to the 10th element in our strategic planning. That's understanding and evaluating the differences between interruption and inbound marketing strategies. Interruption marketing are the type is the type of marketing that someone's maybe engaged in a, they're at a sporting event or they're watching their favorite television show, or uh, they've gone to see a movie. And not by their will, but by virtue of the, the media that they're consuming wants to earn some money, there's some advertising. So um, they go to the sporting event and there's signs all around the arena promoting different products and services, different brands. Well, they didn't come to see the uh, signage. They came to see the event. But by virtue of being there and having the game interrupted in a sort, in a manner, that they're being uh, fed some marketing messages. Uh, that's a form of interruption marketing uh, on television, a television commercial, or... Uh, doing searches and, and uh, or sorry, being on a, a website and seeing an ad show up on the website. You weren't there for the ad. Uh, you were there to consume that information, but you were interrupted by uh, the ad. Uh, another example we see all the time is in our inboxes. Unsolicited spam that hits our mailbox is a form of interruption marketing. And uh, it really does interrupt us, and we get so much of it. But there's reasons for doing it, and we'll swing back to that in a minute. The other type of marketing I mentioned was inbound marketing. This is what happened as a result of search engines. People are looking for specific products and services. They go online to a search engine or a business directory or a shopping site. And they type in what they're looking for, and up comes some promotion about that thing. Well, that is uh, not interruption marketing because it's exactly what the person was seeking. It could be an ad. It could be a directory listing. It could be um, an organic uh, page result. But when they uh, see the thing that they're interested in, they click on it. They consume the information that's provided, and then they take action by filling out a form or uh, calling a phone number or uh, sending a direct message through a social media platform. That's inbound messaging or inbound marketing. And that form of marketing has become exceptionally effective for many organizations. So the question becomes, do I use interruption marketing and annoy some people potentially? Or do I use inbound marketing and wait until they're looking for my product or service? Do I use a combination of them? Uh, how much money do I put behind each of them? 
what's the response rates associated? Does one provide better responses than another? Uh, or is it a hybrid of all of the above? This is really important when you're setting up your marketing uh, strategy is to consider the different uh, types of marketing that fit into the category, understand the pros and cons of each, the cost effectiveness of each, and then also some of the marketing goals in terms of, of timing. Some, some things like search engine optimization, it may take you six, eight months, a year before people are seeing you in their organic results in a favorable position. Whereas an ad uh, may very well get you business tomorrow. So there's, there's a lot to think about and consider there. And so we'll do a session where we're looking at some of these different strategies and identifying those pros and cons and, and help you uh, give consideration to what might be the right mix of strategies when it comes to defining your marketing plan, which of course then brings us to the 11th item, and that's the development of the actual marketing plan. And marketing plan is really uh, what guides our, our uh, activities. Uh, it's the strategy that we're deploying, the messaging uh, that we're um, developing. It's the um, market that we're targeting. It's the positioning uh, that we choose, and it's putting it together with strat uh, not only the strategies, but the, the tactics, uh, what uh, email, uh, SEO, uh, paid advertising, television commercials, um, theater advertising, signage, you know, all those things are strategy or tactics that our strategy will inform We'll define the tactics, the budgets, uh, the timetable for things. All of that is um, contained within the marketing plan. And so, well, and I guess I would add certainly one more thing, uh, 12th thing. That 12th thing is how we're going to measure the effectiveness. Uh, KPIs, analytics, um, metrics, all this stuff different terms for the same thing. When we execute on a marketing strategy using tactics and we're spending some money, we want to measure the result. Was it Peter Drucker who said that uh, uh, if you want to change something, you need to uh, be able to measure it. Uh, you can't change what you can't measure. And so uh, with digital marketing especially, it's very important to identify what success means for each tactic we're deploying and then be constantly monitoring that, comparing it against our goals. So if we set a goal for ads or, or let's say um, social media posts to get um, a thousand impressions each month, well, that's our target. We look at what actually happened in terms of uh, visibility to our target market and we compare the results. And then we make decisions. Do we need to tweak things? Uh, do we need to uh, increase the funding of that particular tactic? Are we finding that it just doesn't work and we need to uh, minimize it or possibly uh, eliminate it from our mix? Uh, Marketing, there's no uh, silver bullet where you say, okay, we're going to accomplish this, put that silver bullet in, aim, shoot, fire, win. Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of trial and error, and we can be as creative as can be. We can dream up all kinds of wonderful things and promotions and, and events and all that. But if we don't measure the effectiveness, we don't know if those things were worth doing and worth repeating. And so when we think about uh, strategic planning, we start at the very top by identifying what motivates us, our purpose, what um, values we hold, our culture, the vision that we set uh, for the organization, where we want to be. And then we work into our personality, our uh, brand guide, uh, the brand story, 
how we're going to connect emotionally with people. We want to define our ideal client profile or profiles, depending on who we're selling to. Um, we want to draw the buyer's journey and then figure out what tactics and strategies, messaging makes sense at which, which spot in that uh, journey. We need to define uh, smart goals and the appropriate tactics to meet those goals. We'll talk about the difference between a goal and a smart goal when we get into this a little deeper as well. Um, we need to understand the difference between interruption and inbound marketing, the pros and cons, the costs, and uh, which makes the most sense at what point. And then we need to develop a, a detailed marketing plan where we identify uh, the strategy that will then inform the uh, tactics and then how are we going to measure the results. I know that was a lot. And it is a lot. And for a company that's betting their future on uh, having a good plan, it's worth doing it well. And it's not something that you actually do once. It's something you start and then you continually refine. Each, uh, each month, we're uh, looking to make adjustments on our quarterly plan. Each quarterly, each quarter, we're looking to make adjustments on our annual plan. And each year, we're looking at seeing if our annual three-year, 10-year pl uh, plan or goals are still legitimate or uh, or do we need to make some changes? So I appreciate you sticking with me and going through this with you. Uh, it was very high level and uh, it encompasses a lot of ground, but we're going to tackle it in more detail in the coming episodes. So once again, I'd like to thank you for tuning in to the uh, Big Kahuna podcast. And I look forward to meeting with you again in the near future. Have a great day.